the uh, hijackers were uh, armed with. And in addition to having the box cutters, they were on a flight Tuesday morning. It happened to be from uh, the uh, from Newark to uh, San Antonio, I believe, or was it or was it Dulles to San Antonio? Newark to San Antonio. The plane, however, was grounded in St. Louis when that whole FAA ground stop, that unprecedented ground stop, occurred. The question is, was that perhaps? A thwarted opportunity. Florida is another place where a lot of these suspects come up. Twelve of the 19 suspects have a link to a Florida aviation school of some kind. Four of them in all, Flight Safety, Embry-Riddle, uh, a place called Huffman, and uh, a place on the, uh, the West Coast uh, in, uh, excuse me, in Vero, Vero Beach, um, uh, Flight Safety, Embry-Riddle, and one other. I'm not remembering it right now. Mm. Pardon me for that. Now, let's go over to San Diego. That's another place where at least three of the suspects were known to have lived. Noak Al Hamzi, American Airlines 77, that's the one that went into the Pentagon. Khalid Al Midar, American 77, and Hani Hanjour, guess what? American 77. They all had links to San Diego. In addition, San Diego became a focus today as FBI, uh, FBI agents went to a very well known aviation education facility called the King uh, Schools. They produce CD ROMs for pilots, 40,000 of them a year, of year, by far the largest in this field. Uh, the FBI searched their records to see if those were, there were any matches. We're told there were. Quickly, uh, in Pennsylvania, the cockpit voice recorder and flight data recorder have been recovered at the Pentagon. The same thing. One of them severely damaged the cockpit voice recorder damaged. Not sure how much information we'll be able to get out of that. That sort of brings us up to date. Also in New York, there was the arrest, which is perhaps bearing the lead a little bit, but this was the person who had the false pilot's license who had been arrested at JFK Airport uh, on Thursday. Uh, police say, if investigators say he is a material witness to all of this. So it is a sweeping dragnet that is really a global dragnet at this global point. Global and across the country. I think that's one of the things that is just an extra sock in the stomach to so many people. When you ask where do these people come from, where they get, <coughs> excuse me, where they get their training, and you find out right here in this country, I think it just has people shocked and amazed. And living here for quite some time. Living here, making ties, making friends, getting to know Americans. It just, it's yet another sock. Mm -hmm. Miles, thank you for that update, that information. And uh, with that, we'll go back up to Washington, D.C. and Judy. Well, Darren, it's perhaps because of information like we're, what we're hearing from Miles that President Bush today used the strongest words he has used since Tuesday's terrorist attacks. The president uh, advised the military today to, quote, get ready to do whatever it takes to win this war. For the first time, the president labeled Osama bin Laden the prime suspect behind what happened. President Bush and his national security team are at Camp David right now, considering their next moves, we are told. And that's where we find our White House correspondent, Kelly Wallace. Kelly. Well, Judy, you are exactly right. You can certainly say this is the strongest rhetoric by President Bush since Tuesday's attacks. In addition to calling on everyone in uniform to get ready, the president also asking the American people to be patient for what he says will be a sweeping and effective campaign against terrorists and those who harbor them. At the secluded presidential retreat in the Maryland mountains, President Bush huddles with his national security team okay, and prepares you know, the you know, American people for war. We're at war. There's been an act of war declared upon America by terrorists, and we will respond accordingly. The president refuses to discuss military options, but for the first time, he specifically names suspected terrorist Osama bin Laden as a, quote, prime suspect behind Tuesday's terrorism spree. Bin Laden is believed to be hiding out in Afghanistan with the ruling Taliban government providing him safe haven. This act will not stand. We will find those who did it. We will smoke them out of their holes. We will get them running and we'll bring him to justice. When asked if those words mean President Bush is considering using ground troops to attack terrorists, aides say nothing has been ruled out. But winning this so-called war and finding the elusive bin Laden won't be easy, says a former Clinton administration official. We're not fighting a military, we're not fighting an organized power, but we're fighting a very uh, diffuse and shadowy organization that has links uh, in many different parts of the world. Knowing Americans are hungry for swift retaliation, the president uses his radio address to say a sweeping response will come in time. You will be asked for your patience, for the conflict will not be short. You'll be asked for resolve, for the conflict will not be easy. You'll be asked for your strength, because the course to victory may be long. 
And aides say President Bush has gained strength from his meeting Friday with more than 200 family members with loved ones still missing, believing his job is to turn their sorrow into something positive for future generations. And while the American people are overwhelmingly supportive of a military response, keeping that support up will be another big challenge for the president, especially if a prolonged military attack results in some U.S. troops losing their lives. Judy? All right, Kelly Wallace uh, reporting from near Camp David, where the president is spending this weekend. And now I think we're back to Aaron. Judy, thank you. Uh, here in New York, uh, funerals today for some of the firefighters who died uh, have gone on. And down on the street, of course, the recovery effort continues. And about a block and a half away from there, uh, on Wall Street today, um, they are beginning to check the systems out uh, that will go into effect. Presumably, all things go well at 9.30 in the morning, on Monday morning. Uh, and we'll be talking about that in, in just a moment or so, but we want to check down on the streets to see what is happening there. First, Richard Roth uh, is down there. Richard? Yes, Aaron. The search goes on uh, here uh, just a few blocks. The overview position here for CNN. Uh, one city official said the uh, toll of those uh, now missing unaccounted for uh, has risen by about 200. Uh, it's gone up to about 4,972. Uh, bodies of two firefighters were located underneath uh, one, an, an old fire engine, they said, in front of uh, the American Express building, caught up on the periphery of the main rubble area. Meanwhile, uh, trucks continue to take uh, thousands of tons of rubble uh, out of the site. Uh, the, the re instead of some of the noise of the vehicles, what you hear now are bullhorns from uh, police security officials saying, uh, please move back onto the sidewalk. This is because uh, more New Yorkers, thousands in, on the east side of New York, have been allowed back, some for a short period of time, to get a look at their possessions and, and their apartment. Uh, one of those returning, the priority for John Solomon, was his pets. I got the mice out. They survived for how many days? Uh, since Wednesday, I stuffed their tank full of food and uh, three bottles of water, and they would never know there was a disaster. Another person who was there, uh, another woman, uh, was given a little bit more time, Carla Bauer, and Carla Bauer uh, returned to her apartment. Uh, she's been living in the area of the World Trade Center for about 20 years. Uh, and she says she wants to stay. She does not plan to move out. The thing that I was the most fearful of when I came back in here was looking out this window. Because this was my view, and it was the World Trade and the Woolworth Building. I've been here since 1981, and I refuse to let anybody push me out of here. And, of course, Aaron, as you mentioned, the funerals uh, are taking place. Mayor Giuliani was out in Long Island for the funeral for uh, the fire chief of New York City, called it a very mournful, sorrowful day, but uh, he believes that New York will show courage and the city will come out stronger for all of this. Aaron? Richard, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, Monday morning at 9.30, after uh, virtually an entire week of being shut down, the markets never opened on Tuesday, I don't believe, uh, Wall Street... New York Stock Exchange, the Amex, the NASDAQ gets back to work. Um, Greg Clarkin is here. I read somewhere, I think this is correct, that that area around uh, the street, Stock Exchange, is the largest user of telecommunications equipment in the world. And all of that's being checked out today is pretty much it because it is, it is uh, the bread and butter of making the system work. Yeah, exactly, Aaron. It's a vast telecommunications system. And this morning, um, technicians at the NYSC as well as at the NASDAQ and the member firms are really going over the uh, telecom systems, the voice and data systems to make sure everything is intact and up and running for 9.30 Monday morning. And right now, we're getting word that barring any last-minute snags, we will indeed have stock trading. The equity markets will resume trading on Monday morning at 9.30. Now, again, the tasks to restore trading were monumental in the eyes of many. You had that vast telecom network, the voice and data that hooks up uh, not only the folks down on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, but folks at other, uh, other member firms on different locations. So you had to make sure all the bugs were worked out of that. And indeed, the New York Stock Exchange CEO and Chairman uh, Dick Grasso this morning saying that right now all systems are go. They are very, very hopeful that they will indeed have trading on Monday morning. And Grasso said not only is it important to get the equity markets back up and running for the economy and for the overall world equity markets, but also it holds a deep, deep symbolic value here in America. 
to send a very important message to the criminals who so heinously attack this country that they've lost. The American way of life goes on, business recommences. And Aaron, at this point, uh, again, Barney, any last minute stacks? They expect to have stock trading. You'll hear that opening bell for the first time since last Monday. And they have, I, I don't know the detail, but I can't imagine they have anything less than something important and symbolic planned for that opening. It will indeed be something to see. They're going to have the opening bell at 930, as tradition has it, and then they'll have two minutes of silence, um, a rendition of God Bless America, and the opening bell will be rung by various um, po uh, political officials as well as representatives of the New York Police Department, Fire Department, Port Authority, and the Emergency uh, Services Units here. So it's expected to be quite an uh, emotional time as a lot of folks, about 3,000 folks to be exact, file back onto that floor for the first time in about a week or so. Um, it I'm not sure exactly all the reporting you've done, so mm -hmm. if I'm about to blindside you, I promise. I apologize. Have you talked to any of the traders down there at all? Are they nervous about both the mechanics of Monday and the emotions of uh, traders, professional and otherwise? Absolutely. In terms of the emotional aspect, it is very close to the Trade Center, and it's a tight-knit community. A lot of folks, uh, new people, uh, no doubt, in the Trade Center, so there'll be a big emotional aspect. As far as the mechanics of the market go, there is some apprehension over just how the system will hold up, as well as what the market's going to do. A lot of folks expect to see a bit of a steep sell-off, at least early on, led by the airline stocks, the insurance stocks, which are especially going to, going to be hard hit. Uh, on that note, the SEC has eased some regulations uh, temporarily to uh, help to, you know, kind of ease trading and stabilize trading a bit. What does that mean? Uh, basically, they'll allow companies, um, they lifted restrictions temporarily to allow companies to, um, on the amount of stock they can buy back, when they can buy it back. Their own their own stock. Exactly. Is, and that would have the effect of, of uh, stabilizing the price? Exactly. Restoring confidence to that particular equity. And I mean, you got to understand you're talking to a guy who barely balances his <laughs> checkbook, okay? Uh, but that would stabilize the price. Exactly. And again, restore confidence not only to that equity, to that stock in particular, but to the markets in general in case there is a steep sell-off in some of those individual stocks. And uh, uh, we know because we had trading around the world over the course of last week, even though we didn't have it here, that the markets, in fact, have been pretty choppy, but they seem to be stable at the end of the day. Exactly. They did get off to a rocky start. And a lot of folks believe that the four-day prolonged shutdown, it's the longest since 1933, they believe that the last couple of days maybe will serve to stabilize the markets rather than drive them down even lower. But either way, a lot of folks are calling or expecting to see at least a sell-off at the very, very outset of trading. Yeah, markets uh, hate a lot of things, and instability is right at the top of the list. Exactly. Um, thank you. Nice, nice sure. work. Just Thanks. came across one quick thing I want to pass along. 20% of all the uh, office space in the city was down there affected by that explosion, 20%. Judy? Well, Aaron, the building here in Washington, where, of course, all the focus of recovery uh, has been on, of course, is the Pentagon. Uh, workers there continuing, as you know, throughout uh, this day, as they have every day since Tuesday, uh, working on that damaged building, trying to pull whatever out they possibly can. Inside, meantime, the work continues on what officials are signaling will be a strong United States military response. And for the very latest on that, let's turn to CNN's military affairs correspondent, Jamie McIntyre. Jamie. Well, Judy, uh, Pentagon officials, of course, are not talking uh, in any detail about what military options the, the Pentagon may be considering in this uh, war against terrorism. Although privately, Pentagon officials are downplaying ex any expectations that there could be an immediate uh, response. Uh, saying that uh, intelligence needs to be analyzed, uh, that needs to be matched with military options, and that any uh, uh, action will be prudent. Meanwhile, uh, action is fully underway to rebuild one of the uh, uh, nation's uh, most uh, impressive symbols of democracy, and that is, of course, the Pentagon building. Even though the focus is on uh, the people here, the building itself has a strong symbolic value, and the Pentagon announced today that they will rebuild this section of the building as quickly as possible. It may take a couple of years, but they let the first contract today, $145 million for a contractor to begin the work. They're going to need to... Um, uh, shore up part of the building and put in new, uh, strip away some of the uh, um, damage, remove about uh, 350 million pounds of debris uh, in order to demolish some of the sections all the way down to the concrete columns and floor, floor slabs. And they say when they rebuild this, 
they will be rebuilding space that's equivalent to more than two